Good evening and welcome to Lowell Observatory's celebration of International Observe the Moon Night and National Astronomy Day. Uh, my name is Kevin Schindler and I'm the historian at Lowell Observatory. And we're pleased to thank uh, Finley Toyota for helping make this uh, special event happen tonight. Um, we're gonna uh, talk about one of uh, the legends of amateur astronomy, um, Robert Burnham. And then we'll also talk about the moon and do some live views from the moon. Um, so um, we're coming live as it were. Um, we're actually, our presenters are all over the place, but, but some of the things you're gonna see are um, from our moon cam. And that's with uh, one of our telescopes um, as part of our Giovanni Open Deck Observatory. This particular one is a five inch tech refractor um, that's gonna show us really great views of the moon. And we'll see some of those throughout the night both during the Robert Burnham presentation and later on. Um, and we're, this is all part of the Godo Plaza. Um, Godo stands for Giovanni Open Deck Observatory. So if you hear us say that, um, that's what we're talking about. Um, this is our new state-of-the-art observing plaza. We opened actually about this time last year. And even though um, we're closed for a lot of our regular programs um, right now because of COVID, um, we're able to operate some of these telescopes and not just for events like this tonight, we're, but we're even doing um, some private viewing sessions. So if you're interested in those, check out our website and you can see how to sign up to view um, in person through the GODO, through the Historic Clark Telescope, and through our newest telescope on the hill, um, a 24 inch uh, Dyer telescope it's called. Um, so um, a lot of great opportunities to get tied into astronomy here. So. Um, this is going to be a really fun night, I think. And we're going to start it off by talking about Robert Burnham. Um, and the first thing I want to do before we start talking about him is introduce some guests we have tonight um, who either knew him or have studied him or, or know the impact of what he did and um, what he means to astronomy. Um, so our first guest is Brian Skiff. Uh, Brian um, is here at Lowell Observatory. Brian knows the sky better than maybe everybody else in the world combined. Um, I don't think that's being too hyperbolic there. Uh, Brian has been at the observatory since the mid 1970s. I um, mean, has observed um, countless nights and, um, and is gonna talk tonight a little bit about um, Robert Burnham and, and the impact he had on astronomy, um, which is a handbook that he did and also um, a, a, a survey of stars. Um, so um, Brian is with us tonight. Our second guest is Donna Courtney. And Donna is Robert Burnham's only living relative and his niece. And um, Donna has a very unique relationship because she knew her uncle very well and used to visit him at, here in uh, Flagstaff at the observatory and remembers going into his old cabin and downstairs and seeing his office and such. Um, so Donna has a really a lot of really great personal insight, I think, into um, Robert. And so um, we'll, we'll be hearing from her. And then our third guest is Tony Ortega. Um, Tony is a journalist and um, years ago, back in the 1990s, um, he was interested in astronomy, wanted to um, connect with Robert Burnham and thus began this quest to learn more about him. And Tony um, has done a magnificent job chronicling um, the life of Robert Burnham, because as we'll find out tonight, um, his, Robert Burnham's name is so legendary in astronomy, and yet personally his life was um, had a lot of tragedy in it and, and ended, we might think, tragically. So um, Tony's going to um, be with us and give us um, some insight into especially um, Robert's post Lowell observatory time. So I think this is going to be a lot of fun. We're gonna hear from each of our guests for about five minutes or so. And then um, we'll just kind of have an, have an open discussion. And this is interactive. So if anybody out there has questions as we go along, um, once the three our three guests have given their introduction after that, then we can start um, asking questions. Um, so we'll get started in a minute. Again, um, welcome on behalf of Lowell Observatory to International Observe the Moon Night and um, also National Astronomy Day. And again, we'd like to thank Finley Toyota for making this happen. So let me just give a really brief introduction to Robert Burnham and why we're talking tonight. And then we're gonna hear a lot more 
um, from our guests. Um, if you've done anything with astronomy, you've probably seen this three volume set called Burnham's Celestial Handbook. And it is, <laughs> there's nothing like it. It can't even be compared to other books because there's nothing like it. It's more than 2000 pages covering all 88 constellations, um, the science, the positions of, of celestial objects within each constellation. There's so much mythology. Um, there's connections to, to pop culture, to ancient coins. It's just this remarkable um, book. And, um, and so if you're in astronomy, you know about this, um, but we don't know so much about Robert Burnham. And so that's what we want to try to accomplish tonight is to, to share some of this story and what better people to talk about than the guests we have. So with that, let me um, turn this over to Brian. Um, I'm gonna put on the slide just so we have um, kind of an idea of what the handbook is. So let me just get this up, Brian, and then you can take her away. All right. And just a second, and then let me just <laughs> start the program here. Okay, I think you're good to go now. Okay, thanks, Kevin. That was a good way to start. So I, I have my, in my five minutes here, there's a lot to cover, but uh, uh, as Kevin mentioned, the, the, the three-volume Celestial Handbook is really an observing guide for amateur astronomers and was compiled uh, basically in the 60s um, by Bob Burnham to, to just share all of this incredible amount of, of knowledge and not just astronomy stuff, but also the cultural context as Kevin mentioned, the coins and the mythology and lots of other, you know, a wide range of things. Um, so uh, uh, the, the three volumes were originally done as a typescript and were um, compiled as loose leaf, as, as loose leaf uh, uh, segments or sections. And then eventually, uh, because it was, there was not a, a big sales market for this sort of thing, uh, he ended up selling the the, uh, the work itself and the rights to uh, Dover Press. And uh, what you see here on the screen are the three printed volumes of the, of the Celestial Handbook, which many people have. And are um, even, the, even the, as you can see in this case, uh, well-worn well volumes that people use and refer to continually. So there's something like 2,000 different objects actually indexed in the books. And, uh, Something maybe more than something more than a hundred, something like the messy objects plus more um, additional brighter objects that that Burnham had actually looked at visually with his own uh, telescopes and specifically ones that he had built himself. Um, and so that is where the where the legacy uh, starts. And uh, um, the author was a bit of a mystery, which we'll we'll hope to elucidate more here this evening. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention, I mean, this is quite an, uh, an incredible collection of stuff and uh, um, includes uh, images from the uh, Pluto camera plates, which uh, Burnham had been uh, using to uh, conduct this uh, survey for nearby stars and, um, and it, just a huge rich resource that's, that's really hard, you know, one of a kind thing that is hard to, hard to reproduce. So the other thing I wanted to mention in my time here is that his job at, at Lowell was to um, work on what became known as the Lowell Proper Motion Survey. So um, briefly in the 30s, Clyde Tombaugh and his successors ended up photographing the entire northern accessible sky, accessible from Flagstaff. And that set of plates, photographic plates, are the oldest deep homogeneous sky survey in existence. So that those plates still exist. So starting in the late 50s, um, Henry Giclis uh, hired uh, Bob Burnham and also Norm Thomas to um, basically repeat, repeat those plates and take another set of those plates and then use a blink machine to actually blink, um, compare the, the two sets of plates and find stars that were, instead of being out at the edge of the solar system like Tombaugh had found, finding stars that were relatively near <coughs> the sun, excuse me, and uh, with a 30 year baseline rather than with a baseline of just a few days. And uh, that project, uh, uh, which went for um, about 15 years, yielded um, about 7,500 new nearby stars, or at least stars that 
had very large motion relative to background stars um, and uh, became actually the most well used set of stars of those sorts um, that, that uh, ended up in the scientific literature. And so that was a huge amount of work. And, and at least to hear Norm Thomas tell it, uh, he, and, he and Bob Burnham did, did all the lion's share of the work, uh, uh, the taking of the plates, the blinking of them, the marking of the plates, the preparation of finder charts, all of this stuff it was a huge amount of work that they did. Um, in it, and in the case, in, in Bob's case, uh, uh, um, in addition to preparing this handbook, um, so there's, you know, he didn't, he wasn't just a one trick pony, but did lots of other stuff as well. That's great, Brian. And, and we'll hear more about um, the work of, of Robert as we go on tonight, but it really is an incredible um, legacy he left. And um, the story of how he put this together and everything is fascinating. And I should point out that this picture we're showing is, um, shows Tony Ortega's um, very well-worn set of Berman's <laughs> handbook. And um, probably any amateur astronomer out there who has this set has a similar looking dog-eared set because you use it all the time. All right, well, let's, you know, we, we've, we've got this handbook and, you know, what kind of person <laughs> does something like this, has the, the dedication, the devotion um, to do this sort of thing? We're gonna bring in um, now Robert Burnham's only living relative um, and niece, um, Donna Courtney. And Donna's gonna tell us a little bit about Robert's Burnham life, Robert's uh, early life, and kind of how he got, you know, interest in astronomy and who was this person who created this handbook? So Donna, um, let me turn it over to you. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Uh, thank you for inviting me to participate tonight. Uh, real quick, I wanna let you know I'm having internet connectivity problems. So if you suddenly lose Excuse me, that's where I'm. So to begin with, uh, Robert Burnham was born in a suburb of Chicago, uh, Aurora, Illinois. Uh, his mother, my grandmother, was not in good health. And in the late 1930s, she was advised by her physician to seek a high, dry climate for her health. And that is how the family ended up moving to Arizona. They selected uh, Prescott, Arizona for the climate. And so uh, my grandparents, his parents, and uh, Robert and his sister Viola, who are seen in this picture, uh, moved to Prescott, and that is where, and that was approximately 1940 when they moved to Arizona. Uh, he took, uh, he finished his his only formal education there in Prescott in the public school system, graduated from high school, uh, went into the Air Force. He didn't want to be drafted, so he went into the Air Force for four years, where he worked as a shipping clerk, which is not a very auspicious uh, career choice for someone who turned out to do the level of work that he later, he did later on in his life. Uh, upon returning from the Air Force, he came back to Prescott and he went to work. Uh, he was always, he was a very intelligent person and very curious and interested on a wide variety of topics. He was interested in natural history, oriental philosophy, uh, ancient history, and particularly astronomy was an interest of his. He drew, he played musical instruments. His interest in astronomy and the, no doubt, the lack of great financial means at that time in his life led him to build his own telescopes. Uh, he had a telescope that he would prop up on the front porch of the house there in Prescott uh, to observe the sky. Uh, this is a picture of the front of the house that he grew up in in Prescott. This is Robert in his Air Force uniform after he was discharged. Uh, his sister, uh, Marguerite Viola, who was my mother. And then to the right is Robert Burnham Sr., uh, his, his father. In the background to the right, you can see one of his handmade telescopes leaning against the, uh, the railing there of the front porch. During this time period, which was the late 50s, uh, the United States was in a, a big technology race with uh, Russia to put a man on the moon to really advance in technology. It was at the height of the Cold War. And Robert discovered a comet 
and my grandmother, who at that time, there were, there were, she was not the only one. There were a number of people in the fifties and sixties who had a hobby of writing letters to the editors of newspapers. And my grandmother was a prolific writer of such letters that had commentary on politics, religion, you name it. And because she was known to the local paper, she, you know, she wrote this up that he had discovered, uh, he had discovered a comet with this homemade telescope. And that brought the attention of Senator Barry Goldwater, who came up to Prescott, met the family, met my uncle, actually gifted Robert with a telescope. All of this the hyperbole around this discovery caused uh, Henry Bickless at Lowell Observatory to uh, notice Robert. And out of that eventually came a job offer to come to Lowell to work on the proper motion survey, which Brian just uh, described to everyone. So at Lowell, at Lowell uh, Robert lived in a small cabin on the grounds and he had literally, for him, it, it was the perfect thing because he did, his, he always remained an amateur at heart even through all of his years at Lowell. Uh, astronomy was a passion of his and a love. And the, what eventually became the handbook started out as a star catalog that he did for himself. It was on little file cards, the kind that, if anyone remembers the three by five recipe cards that maybe your grandmother had that had recipes on it, that's how this handbook started, was on recipe file cards in little metal file boxes. And eventually it grew. And at some point he decided to try and publish it uh, for the use of others. Uh, as Brian mentioned, the initial publication of it were, was actual typewritten pages uh, put in three ring loose leaf binders. Uh, as a small child, age four and five in the early 60s, um, I was paid a nickel a copy to go around a long table in the basement of a little observatory to collate copies of uh, the loose leaf handbook. Uh, that was uh, the, the handbook, more than anything, really reveals. It, it gives insight into who he was as a person because in addition to all of the uh, astronomical information, there's ancient history, there's uh, a, uh, oriental philosophy, there's just a wide variety of additional information that's interwoven into the astronomical information. And I think that's part of what has made those books so beloved by amateurs. This is a picture of, of Robert and Norm Thomas at the Blink Comparator uh, in the early 60s at Lowell. Kevin? Well, that's a, that's a nice little background about, about Robert and kind of getting to Lowell. And, you know, he, was, he worked here for 21 years and um, then left. And then the rest of his life was a mystery for a long time. Well, well, a lot of amateur astronomers especially knew the handbook. There was a lot of confusion about Robert Burke. Um, he wasn't at Lowell anymore, but also there was another um, person, an editor of, of astronomy magazine um, named Robert Burnham also. Um, so there was confusion of who this person actually was. Um, so, you know, once uh, Robert left, lots of mystery, but, but we have the guy who figured out this mystery um, Tony Ortega. Um, so Tony, why don't you tell us just a little bit about um, what you learned and, you know, what kind of happened with Robert's life later on? Thanks, Dennis. Uh, well, yeah, that's uh, this thing was learned what you can see a feeling from the tree. So I was there for the summer and I was I mean, for example, it was one of the most important points in my life. And at one point, I was curious about it and we were doing research. And um, I was looking at old pieces of fun magazine and a couple of photos and you know like Robert Burton, who was writing those monthly uh, compilations on the fun magazine, was not Robert Burton Jr., who was the example. And back to the what I realized back to the speaker to realize Robert Burton Jr. had put out a book about the sky and almost nothing else in his entire life about the and that got me really intrigued. But one day I was I was just been on late for a long, long time. <laughs> that uh, I, I had become the best there for the getting two times, and I just had this you know desire. I was just meet for who was this guy? How did he just put up with the kid? It we all love nothing else. And he he was you know he was a 
just interrupt for a second there um your sound is is bad and i wasn't sure if that was just my system but can you maybe toggle um off your sound and then back on again and see if that makes a difference and as tony's testing that um i just want to again welcome everybody this is low observatory celebration of international observe the moon night in National Astronomy Day, sponsored by Finley Toyota. Try that again. This darn thing off me. Uh, let's see. That's that's a lot better, Tony. There we go. Sorry about that. I was on the mi wrong microphone there for a minute. And would, would you mind just um, now that you have that? introduction mastered would you mind repeating it so <laughs> <laughs> okay just uh, the faster version is i love the handbooks i wanted to know more about the man who had written it i started searching for him and that led me to brian skiff at lowell who in turn introduced me to norm thomas norm told me that he didn't know if burnham was alive or dead this was 1997. he didn't know if, she, if 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 bob was alive or dead but he knew that bob had a sister in Phoenix. And so I set out to find that sister. And all that Norm knew was that their mother, Lydia Burnham, had died in Prescott in the 70s. And so I spent hours going through old issues of the Prescott Courier until I found it, the obituary for Lydia Burnham in 1977. And it listed the names of the family, including Robert Burnham Jr. and his sister, Marguerite Viola Courtney. Now, let me tell you, as a reporter, I was so happy because the worst thing that happens is when you get people with very common names like John Smith, you'll never find them. But Marguerite Viola Courtney, I, I thought, oh, that's it. That'll be easy. What I did was I went down to the voter records in Phoenix and I looked up uh, all the voters in, in Maricopa County. Would you believe it? There were two Marguerite Viola Courtney's living in Phoenix in 1997. <laughs> One of them mentioned they were originally from, the record said she was originally from Ohio. And I said, oh, that, or Illinois, I don't remember which one. That's, that's the one. And that's how I, I got to reach out to Viola and Donna and got to meet them. And that's when Viola informed me in 1997 that her brother had died in 1993. And I, I knew this was amazing because I knew how much this book meant to the astronomy world and virtually nobody knew about this. And so I spent a lot of time I, I, I spent time with Viola and Donna. I went up and I, I spent time with Norm. Uh, he took me down to the basement to show me the blink comparator, uh, showed me the plates from their, their sky survey. He actually pulled out the Pluto plate, Tombaugh's Pluto plate to show me. I was so frightened. <laughs> it was so wonderful. Uh, and I got to interview Henry Glick Gickless, who had hired Burnham and had and employed him for 20 years. And then I was able to put together my story uh, in 1997 for the Phoenix New Times um, uh, about Burnham's life and what I what I knew about it, that he he had done that incredible survey with Norm, but when it was over, I heard from numerous astronomers who said to me, one of, one of the things that they were frustrated about Bob was he never seemed to plan for the future. He never seemed to have a plan for what was gonna happen when that survey ended. And so uh, when, the, when that plan ended, uh, you know, he didn't have a job anymore at Lowell. And, he seemed not to really know what to do next. 
Um, and Viola was very concerned about him. And then one day he just vanished. Um, and years later, people spotted him that knew him. He was in San Diego living in a cheap hotel and he was selling paintings of cats in Balboa Park. Um, and uh, I remember I, I mentioned this to the, uh, the man, the, the astronomer who runs the, uh, um, the, the planetarium there in Balboa Park. And he couldn't believe it because he'd heard about this guy. He says, I can't believe we had Robert Burnham here. But uh, yeah, he died in 1993, um, uh, various ailments. And uh, really, you know, he should have, you know, he's only in his 60s. Um, and it's a shame. But, you know, on the other hand, he had left so much for the rest of us. He had done such a great work with that handbook. And I'm just so happy that Lowell today is recognizing him for that work. I think it's really great that you're doing that, Kevin. And this is something, you know, several years ago, um, Tom and Jen Palakis down in um, Phoenix helped lead a charge with other amateur astronomers um, to, to get funding to build, to put up a plaque um, celebrating Robert Burnham. And that was kind of the, yeah, I guess the beginning of, of wanting to build more and more awareness about him. And we're in the process of uh, creating a display right now that, that talks about um, Robert and his life. So um, we hope to be doing more and more to, bring attention to, you know, the life of this incredible person. You think about the history of Lowell Observatory, and we've had a lot of fascinating people. Um, and Robert's one of these that we want to sh share. So, so Tony, thanks for that introduction. I'm going to stop sharing the program now. And let's bring the rest of our guests back on, um, Brian and Donna. And um, we can leave this open for some questions. We'll take those as they come in. And then generally, we'll just uh, talk a little bit about Robert. Um, so we've got this guy who, you know, homegrown, as it were, down in Prescott, um, self-interest in astronomy, self-taught. Um, and, and it's interesting because there's a lot of that at Lowell Observatory in the early days. Percival Lowell um, learned his astronomy, you know, self-taught. And... Clyde Tamba, who discovered Pluto here, um, was self-taught. And, and, and Clyde Tamba, by photographing the sky, as Brian mentioned, has served as the first generation for the Prepper Motion Survey, which brought Robert Burnham in, the self-taught astronomer. So really a kind of a <clears throat> heritage there with the observatory. So let's, let's just uh, look a little bit more um, at, at Robert. Um, Tony, when you wrote that story, in the New Times, what kind of reaction did you get from people, whether astronomers or, you know, people who are familiar with the name? Well, you know, I wasn't sure whether my editors were even going to want it. I mean, to me, it was this wonderful mystery that I had solved. And I, the more I learned about Burnham, the more fascinated I was. Uh, and, and, you know, um, Viola shared his, some of his private papers with me. So I got to see some of the correspondence he had with people. I thought it was all wonderful, and I just wasn't sure, uh, first of all, whether my own editors were going to be interested. But once I showed them the draft, they just loved it. They were begging me for more photos. They, they knew that this was such a unique Arizona story that, uh, that people, no matter what their backgrounds, were going to find fascinating. And I, I think the paper was really proud to publish that issue. And we got a huge reaction. I still get, I still get emails today from people uh, how long was it? It was 23 years ago I wrote that story. Mm -hmm. And I'm still getting emails today from people telling me how much that it meant to them to read that about Burnham and find out. I mean, look, there's some things in his life that weren't great and, and he had some tough times, but he's such a fascinating person and, and the work he left behind is so amazing. Tony, this is probably a good time maybe to mention where people can see your story. Um, yeah, so so the Phoenix New Times published that in 1997, but, you know, uh, as and, and good for them, they still have that story up. But over the years, stories that are that old at newspaper sites tend to, they, they look less and less good. So I decided to republish it on my own site at TonyOrtega.org. So if you type in Robert Burnham, Tony, at, and then TonyOrtega.org, it'll bring up the link. And I have republished the story with all of the original art and, and more and other photos that we weren't able to publish at the New Times, just wonderful color slides that Viola gave me of Burnham over the years and, and, and the two of them together. 
And some of the some of the ones like the one you're showing tonight was was uh, behind you right now of him at the Plutoscope was a photo I got from Viola. So uh, um, I, it, it's hard to just say what the link is, but to, you know Robert Burnham, TonyOrtega.org, it'll come right up. Okay. And let me just mention, uh, Donna, you can come on back. There you are. And Donna, you can turn your sound on also. I mean, as you're do doing that, let me ask you, Brian, um, when, you, when you read Tony's article and when you were working with him for that story, I mean, what did you think when you found out about what happened to him? Oh, it was all new to me. Uh, I think a lot of us around here uh, did, simply didn't know the story. And, um, uh, you know, of the... Of the what happened afterwards. Um, and so I knew that he wasn't at Lowell. I knew him when he was at Lowell because I started coming here in the, in the, in the mid seventies um, and uh, knew that the proper motion survey was winding down and, and that Henry Giclos specifically was retiring so that um, both Norm and, and Bob didn't have a, you know, <laughs> you know, the project was over <laughs> and so they had to move on somehow or other. And, um, you know, at the last time I saw uh, uh, Bob was I as, um, was in the spring. I'm pretty sure it was the spring of 1983 when there was a bright comet called Iras Iraqi Alcock that came through um, in April and May of that year that that uh, a lot of people saw. It was a naked eye comet, and uh, I happened to see him um, in down in Flagstaff, and and we chatted briefly because there was another comet that I had a that came along that I had a picture of and I remember showing it to him that, and uh, we just chatted briefly but after that he seems seemed to have disappeared so the um, uh, what Tony found out was news to I think you know almost everybody mm -hmm. let's bring on um, Robert Burnham's only living relative and his niece Donna Courtney then they come on back on and and I wanted to ask you you know when you found out um, what happened to your uncle um, he had he had been he had disappeared for a while, but maybe talk about that a little bit more, and and what the you know your family's reaction was to this news that Tony found. And I think we still have Donna. Then, if you could turn your volume on, and maybe Tony, you can talk a little bit more about that while. Yeah, I mean, one thing that Donna did, uh, I'm sure she can talk about, is. Um, he, Burnham had a kind of a strange episode in California and he had sort of lost a few days and was at, found out by some police on a beach with terrible sunburn. And like he'd just been wandering around and she had to drive out there and pick him up and bring him back to Arizona. So, you know, they were all very concerned about him. He just, you know, I, I remember um, Viola's partner, um, was telling me that he was just this incredible intellect. He was, he could talk about any subject under the sun. He was so, he had such incredible callback of, of all the historical things he'd read about, but he just had a hard time taking care of himself. You know, Burnham was the kind of guy that was such a treasure, but he, it's a shame there wasn't somebody that could just take care of him all the time because he, the most simple basic things about getting along in life, he had a tough time with, but Donna had to go get him and bring him back. And she was really concerned about him. That was one of those. Uh, like uh, I, I, yeah, I'm, really I'm having trouble with my internet connection. I've had to go onto my phone as a hotspot. Um, I keep getting disconnected. Um, the things of California, working in California, he had disappeared from the apartment in Flagstaff. And, the and Don, your sound is kind of... Donnie, your sound is kind of cruddy. I'm not sure if you can adjust that. I, I'm trying. I'm picking it over my phone right now because my home internet has decided to go down. Okay. Uh, I, don't. Well, I think we lost Don again. Apologies for technology issues there. Um, but let's uh, take a couple of questions that are coming in. One, I was going to have Don answer this. I think we all know the answer to this. But um, Tony, since you knew um, Robert very well, even though you may never met him. <laughs> the question was, did, did Robert have kids? No, he didn't. He never, he never got married. In fact, uh, uh, one of the things I learned when I was researching was uh, Viola told me she ever only ever saw him uh, with a girlfriend one time. 
And I actually tracked her down. She was a she was a woman who I think was either an intern or however worked there at the Lowell Observatory. Uh, but she was a Washington State, I think, uh, astronomer who was there for the summer. And uh, I actually I actually located her and talked to her about it. She said she had a real nice you know summer with Bob. And the, you know the thing about Bob's cabin uh, and Brian Skiff ended up living there, right? Was that. Uh, it, it was like this museum. It was this wonderful place to be. And she told me about how, how, how much fun it was to go there and just listen to Bob. I mean, Bob could just spend tales. And, and, and uh, so that was fun. But no, he never, he never married, never had children. Okay. And again, um, you're watching Lowell Observatory celebration of International Observe the Moon Night and National Astronomy Day, um, supported by Finley, Toyota, and Flagstaff. And our guests are Tony Ortega, um, who's chronicled Robert's life. Um, our, one of our um, scientists here at Lowell Observatory, Brian Skiff, and Donna Courtney, who is Robert Burnham's niece and only living relative. I um, mean, we, we have a question from Mike Bakich um, of astronomy. Um, he, and he's saying uh, several years ago, he met with Donna about the possibility of updating the handbook. And I think there's a question that a lot of people kind of wonder about. Um, anyways, uh, Michael met with Donna and she told me her mom had an agreement with somebody else with the same idea. And the question is uh, for Michael, is there any work being done on, on the handbook on updating it? You know, when I, when I did uh, my story, I talked to Brian about that. And uh, Brian actually was interested in that idea at one time and, and told me just, you know, the, the, the sheer <laughs> monumental work was, but, but the problem with a, a new edition of the handbook is that Bob sold it outright to Dover. And Dover is a reprint house. They don't publish new books. So uh, you'd have to somehow convince Dover, who owns that work outright, to either turn it over to somebody else or something. And I, I don't think that's the problem with uh, there ever being a newer version. Yeah, I think uh, you'd end up having basically a new work altogether. And uh, there are a couple of people struggling to do such a thing. Um, and for which they have several volumes out. This is coming from uh, Wilmot Bell Publishers. And, and they're uh, wonderful books. Those are what the, yeah. annal, the annals. They're, they're, this they're is wonderful the annals works. Of the deep sky. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I mean, just so much work and wonderful. Uh, I think Burnham would have re re really enjoyed them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they are really concentrating on the science uh, aspect of it. And, uh, but really don't, I don't mainly more than at least as much as anything. They just don't have the time or the, the breadth of the background to have that, that huge uh, cult, cultural context that, that Robert put into the Celestial Handbook. And I think we have Donna back up again. Um, if you are there, Donna, let's get your sound and video on. Um, and as we're doing that, let's just talk about, um, you know, the handbook and, in. You know, we talk some about how it needs to be updated, but Brian, maybe you can talk about this as um, somebody in the astronomy world. Um, you know, how, how useful is it still today? I, that's pre a pretty open question because yeah. useful, you can use it for history or you can use it for other things, but maybe talk about that a little bit. Well, I think the, the basic, uh, you know, object list of, you know, things that you might want to look at visually in the telescope is completely valid now as it was back then. And uh, there's really nothing wrong with it um, yeah, from that aspect. And, and it would certainly, uh, uh, you know, you wouldn't miss any of the highlights by, <laughs> you know, following along and observing everything that he, he made a list of and, uh, and having the context to go with it, I think is, you know, is, you know, is why it's still, still well known. I mean, you mm -hmm. could certainly, you know, go through and, you know, make a new work that would have new science in it. But again, you may, even more so than back then, you know, that's a really, that's a moving target. It's moving faster than it used to be. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that, so that um, if you wanted to have books rather than, you know, printed books rather than something online, uh, then you, you'd be, you'd be struggling <laughs> to do something like that. Well, the, it seems that, you know, the handbook, is as complicated in its own way as the guy who wrote it. Um, yeah. And why, you know, why did he tell the rights in the first place? Uh, I have no idea other than, and maybe, maybe Tony has an insight into that. Well, 
I don't think he had much of a choice. Uh, he talks in his, the only other thing he published besides the handbook was this wild self interview in astronomy magazine in 1982, mm -hmm. which is wonderful. And the thing in a, the thing that astronomy put out is only about a third of the thing he actually wrote. I got, a, I got a hold of the full self interview and, and published it at the village voice uh, about know, eight or nine years ago. Uh, and that's not too hard to find. And he explains in there that there just wasn't a publisher for this thing. I mean, it was just, there's just no market for it, no publisher for it. He had been trying to publish it himself, as Brian explained with those leaf, loose leaf notebooks uh, for several years. And, and as he said, he would wake up uh, in a nightmare and sweat thinking he was publishing the Britannia. You know, it, was just, <laughs> it, it was Britannica. I mean, it was just, it was just, it was just too much for one man. Yeah. And so Dover says, you know, we'll, we'll publish the whole thing. Here's $1,500. And, you know, what was his other opportunity? He had no other way to do that. I mean, this, and this wasn't a time, maybe today it would be a little bit more realistic with the amount of self-publishing that's done today. But he, he gave, he turned over everything to Dover and then completed the third volume. The third volume was really completed for the Dover edition. And so that's what he gave, uh, and they gave him $1,500. Now, as far as royalties, I always get asked about royalties too. The Dover deal was for outright. The Dover, Dover deal paid no money, no royalties. However, there's a writer in his contract saying any other edition, he gets royalties. So when the uh, uh, Astronomy Book Club, ABC, started printing their version, uh, he was getting royalties from that. And they were not too bad. I mean, I think there were something like, five or $6,000 a year for several years. When, remember when the handbook was really popular was in the you know, mid eighties. And uh, he was making some money from that, but only because the ABC was coming out with it. Well, it looks like we have about four minutes left in our Robert Burnham discussion. So if there are any other questions out there, um, send those in to us. Um, we're with Tony Ortega, Brian Skiff, and Donna Courtney, I think is is with us. I'm not quite sure that her, she's having some trouble with the internet connection. Um, but we have a couple more minutes um, to talk about Robert. Um, what's you know what's his legacy now? You know we know about the, the the handbook, but you know you know Robert the person and what's his what's when we look down the road, what's he going to be remembered for? I still think to this day, in various places on Earth. Uh, particularly in the United States, late at night with people sitting around with telescopes and somebody looks at something and asks a question, you're always going to hear somebody say, what does Burnham say about it? Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, we, it's just the first reference you reach for because he visited, he, he, he created this map for, if you've got a telescope between two and 12 inches, he's got something to say about virtually everything you can see in your, with that instrument. So uh, he's just created this wonderful adventure map for us to follow and with such personality and, 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 you know, the things he has to say about Chinese poetry blow my mind. I mean, every time I go through it, I'm always finding something new that just is amazing to me. He's, he's put in there. And Tony, I think you described this well as, um, in your article, calling it a real life hitchhiker's guide, um, to the, to the galaxy or whatever. And I think that really does describe it well. And one of the things he says, I mean, the introduction is also just absolutely wonderful. Pick up the first volume and go through the first 60 pages. One of the points he makes is that, you know, he was also into rock collecting and minerals and things like that. But the problem for the rock collector is you're not always going to have the best specimen uh, and you can't afford the best specimen. But every astronomer can recover the most wonderful jewels in the night sky simply by looking up. We all have access to the same treasures. I thought that was a great point that he made. Well, this is great. We're, we're winding down on our time. Uh, we'd like to thank our guests for joining us tonight, uh, Tony Ortega, who spent a lot of time more than a couple of years ago um, tracking down um, Robert Burnham and what, what became of him. Uh, Brian Skiff, who's certainly used um, the handbook. And, and um, if there was going to be somebody out there to, to update it, um, I don't know how much time it would take to do that, but, but in terms of the expertise, Brian would be somebody at the top of the list to do that because he had nothing else to do. Um, and then um, oh, he did, he did. I love the Luke and Buell and Skiff book of the night sky. That's fantastic too. Oh, it's a classic. I think that's a great for yeah using outside and Donna Courtney, 
um, Robert Burnham's uh, only surviving relative, niece. And um, we'd like to thank you all for joining us tonight um, and discussing this really important um, character in astronomy history um, who, who wrote this spectacular handbook that's still um, very popular today. So thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you, Kevin. And again, this is um, Low Observatory's coverage of International Observe the Moon Night and National Astronomy Day. Um, we've just been speaking um, with some guests about um, Robert Burnham, uh, important person in astronomy history who created a, this is a spectacular handbook that's used today. Uh, we're now gonna transition in to the second part of our program, and that's to focus on the moon because we are part of International Observe the Moon Night. And we're using telescopes from our Giovanni Open Deck Observatory um, to, to see live views of the moon. Um, so we're excited about doing that. So I'm gonna turn this program over. Um, I believe Jose is gonna take over here. So I'm gonna keep talking until Jose comes on or um, there you are. And I'll turn it over to you. And, and I should point out that um, I'm turning it over to Joe Schindler, and I'm Kevin Schindler. We are um, long lost cousins, as we call each other. We're not related, um, I guess, familially, but other ways we are. So it's really <laughs> to be able to turn this back to you. Uh, yeah, thanks, cousin. Um, uh, yeah, hi, everyone. I'm Jose. I am an employee at Lowell Observatory. I'm in the public programs. and. Uh, We've already got some questions about the moon <laughs> uh, that came in. It looks like, um, has the, the moon protected the Earth from space objects recently? It's got plenty of battle scars. Uh, as far as I'm aware, I don't know of any recent encounters that the moon has had with any uh, space debris, uh, although I'm sure there, you know, there's always something out there that's going to crash into it, but I haven't heard it anything recently about it, so I couldn't tell you. Uh, but that does actually bring me right into the presentation that I'm going to go ahead and get started. Just give me a second to uh, pull this up real quick. So um, I'm going to be spending some time talking about how our studies of the moon has taught us about a little bit about the history of the Earth. You know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't think that you can learn about the Earth from studying something uh, so far away, but as it turns out, uh, you can. So that's, so that's what I'm going to talk about here for a few minutes or so. Uh, let's just jump right on into it. So uh, just a little bit of... Oh, sorry about that. Uh... <laughs> Um, I guess uh, I'm going to have someone, before I start speaking, I guess someone is going to, um, I'm going to bring uh, Sarah Bircher into this particular uh, discussion real quick. Uh, she's going to talk about something and then we can get started with that real quick. All right. So, hi, this is uh, Rezi from Lowell Observatory, uh, stealing Sarah's name a little bit. But uh, I just wanted to jump in real quick and give a brief introduction for our Observe the Moon Night. As Kevin mentioned, we're moving into the end of the night where we're going to start focusing on that international Observe the Moon Night. Uh, I would have a video up here, but I am at the Geovel Open Deck Observatory. We're actually going to be doing our premium experience in just a few moments here. So. It's dark, I can't really show my face. Uh, we are really excited for that program, by the way. We've been having people come up every night to have their own um, private viewing experiences, both at the Geoval Open Deck Observatory, also at the historic Clark Refractor, and in our newest telescope, the Dyer Telescope. So we've been super excited to have those programs. Um, real quick, I do have just a couple of slides to lay out some context for the history of observation of the moon. 
And this will only take a quick moment, as I said, because we do have those groups coming up here tonight. Uh, by the way, if you are interested in one of those premium experiences, you can reserve tickets for them online at the Lowell website. Um, so to get started in Observe the Moon uh, and the history of observing the moon, uh, just I wanted to mention very briefly that humans have had a long history of observing the moon and taking into account the different moon phases. Um, for example, right here, I have just a couple of pictures of a couple of lunar and solar calendars. So I both have a Hebrew calendar from 1920. The Hebrew calendar is lunar and solar. Um, and then I also have this ninth century calendar that lays out a couple of years. And you can see that both the motions of the sun and the moon were hugely taken into account. So humans have been staring up at the moon since the dawn of time, well, the dawn of human time. Um, and that's for good reason. Right here I have pictures from the tide pools in Ketchikan, Alaska. Uh, the moon does impact things here on Earth, most notably the tides. What's interesting about this area, Ketchikan, Alaska, is that uh, up north has the strongest tides in the world. They actually see a difference of about 40 feet uh, between low tide and high tide, and it really is tremendous. And life on Earth has actually evolved to adapt to these tides caused by the moon. Uh, there is life that lives in these tide pools, like these little starfish here, uh, and hermit crabs, and all the like that rely on the ocean lowering and leaving behind these pools where things can live and hunt for food. And then, of course, that tide rises, and they're all swallowed up under the sea again. Um, one of the first uh, big observations of the moon that I think of when I think about observing the moon was done using the half moon. And this was done by a man named Aristarchus. Uh, he used the half moon, just like in this image right here. He used the half moon and he used the angle where the sun was setting compared to the half moon. And doing this, this was before trigonometry was invented or anything like that, but doing this, he estimated uh, that the sun was much further away from the earth than the moon was. And he also came up with the first rough heliocentric model, that is the model that the earth revolves around the sun instead of everything revolving around the earth. Of course, uh, a couple uh, centuries, well, more than a couple centuries, about a thousand and five hundred years passed between these observations and uh, the time when we started to widely adapt a heliocentric model of our solar system. But he did this, and he was a little bit wrong. Uh, the math wasn't really there for him yet, but it was a good start, and he did this with his observations of the moon. Uh, Galileo was the first person to look at the moon with a telescope, and he found something interesting. And I'm sure that you can see in our little moon image we have off to the side, uh, the moon is not perfect when you put a telescope on it. You can see those craters, and you can see that terminator where the shadow um, meets the lit up part of the moon. It's very rugged. There are big craters. Before then, we had thought that maybe the moon was this perfect uh, sphere in the sky, Galileo starts observing it with a telescope and he goes, no, there are geological features, there are craters, there are mountains, there are canyons. Galileo also, of course, pointed his telescope at Jupiter and observed something very interesting. Uh, as you can see in this little image, uh, off to the side, there are moons that you can see when you observe Jupiter. He was the first person to observe moons around another celestial body. And he theorized at the time that maybe Earth wasn't that unique. Uh, maybe there were moons around a lot of bodies. And he was, of course, right. But we have found since that our moon is unique in a few different ways. So, for example, um, our moon is unusually large, especially for the moon of a terrestrial planet. Uh, gas giants have big moons, but Earth is the only inner planet rock planet that has a moon anything as near uh, in size uh, as ours is. Um, and I guess one of my favorite things about observing the moon is just how the moon has inspired so much, both creativity, but also this ambition to leave the earth and go outward. Here I have a frame from the very famous uh, Journey to the Moon 
Um, and then, of course, I have pictures from the Apollo mission. And I think that the history of observing the moon has been one of inspiring a passion and a drive in humanity, which is where I'm going to end in this quick little overview. Um, I sometimes joke when people will ask me, what's your favorite thing about the moon? And I'll answer uh, that it's going to be a gas station. Uh, so we do have programs uh, in effect right now, uh, the Artemis mission being led by NASA, which is intending to go back to the moon uh, for the purpose of establishing in the long term a refueling station uh, for the hope that we can use the moon as a base to reach other planets like Mars. And I wanted to share their mission statement here real quick with the Artemis program, NASA will be able to put first woman and next man on the moon by 2024. Uh, that's the current date. I think it's been updated a couple of times since. Uh, using innovative technologies uh, to research more of the lunar surface than ever before, we'll collaborate with our commercial and international partners and establish methods of sustainable exploration by the end of the decade. And then of course it ends with using the moon to take that next step to Mars. So I think that's what's special about nights like these where we take a moment to observe the moon. I think uh, when we observe the moon, we're both kind of respecting this history of an observation of the moon, but also respecting this idea of the moon as inspiration to go out further and reach out to the stars. Uh, with all of that said, I'm going to turn you guys back to Jos here. Uh, he's going to talk a little bit more than about some more detail on those uh, observations of the moon and some more detail on how we use observations of the moon to understand our own Earth. Uh, yeah, thank you for um, that information, Rezi. Uh, we're going to, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and just get started on the presentation again. Let me pull it up real quick. So. Uh, so everybody should be seeing this now, but uh, yeah, so I'll talk a little bit about just um, the history of the Earth as told by the moon, basically. Uh, so as it turns out, we can learn a lot about the Earth's history from studying the moon, and we're going to see why. And apparently my down arrows aren't, I'm not able to scroll. There we go. And so we're going to talk a little bit about the geo of the earth first. It's something that's a bit more familiar to us. Uh, this might be, you know, a little bit of review for many people here, but we're going to go over it anyway. Uh, so some of the things that we already know is that the earth's surface is uh, not stagnant. It is constantly changing itself uh, through various means. Uh, we see that, um, there's erosion processes happening, right? We have wind and we have water and they are constantly uh, tearing down rocks and breaking them into small sediments. And you can see some examples here that I have, we have on the left-hand side. Um, this is a geologic feature we have in Northern Arizona. Um, it's called the elephant's feet. And uh, you can find this just a little bit north of Flagstaff. And this is a structure that while there's a lot of other geologic processes that have formed this structure, it's largely being affected by the wind currently. And the wind is tearing that down and smoothing those rocks off. And that sand by the wind is being carried off somewhere else. And then of course, there's um, the Grand Canyon over here on the right-hand side, which um, most people are familiar with. And the Grand Canyon is an enormous structure that has been carved out by a single river and it's about a mile deep, and that took millions of years to do. And again, there's sediment that is in that river. If you look in the river, it's gonna be kind of brown and crummy looking. Uh, that river's carrying sediment away from this location and it's depositing it down south. So we can see areas where rocks are being torn apart by wind and water here on earth. And then of course, we also have new land that is being created where that sediment is going to. In the lower left, there's um, some pictures of some sand dunes 
right over here. So sand dunes are sort of like the process of erosion happening. You can see sediment is being pushed by the wind. It'll go miles and miles over a very long period of time. And then on the uh, upper right side, that is an image of the Mississippi River Delta. And the Mississippi River, just like the Colorado, is carrying sediment from far north, miles and miles away, all the way down and depositing, depositing it down in the Gulf of Mexico. So right there where the Mississippi River Delta is, we're actually seeing new land being built up, right? So that Gulf Coast is technically growing, even though it's a very long period of time for something like that to happen. So now we have new land. We have old land getting torn down in some places, new land being built up in others over very long periods of time through these processes. But of course, we also have some very sudden processes that happen on Earth, uh, and not just on Earth, but on other planets as well, uh, like volcanoes is what I'm going to focus on here a little bit. So volcanoes are taking molten Earth from underneath the ground and bringing it up to the surface and depositing it on the ground. So now it is filling in or covering up old land, or in this case here in this lower right corner that is uh, on Hawaii right there, we have this volcano's uh, eruption. We have the lava that is spilling out into the ocean. Uh, the big island of Hawaii is one. I really like talking about the volcanism there because that is a perfect example of seeing brand new land being created constantly. Uh, the big island of Hawaii is literally getting bigger just in this picture right now. So that's another way that we can have old land just get covered up by new land. And so that means that Earth's surface is changing. There's nothing that is staying still about it, which means we're not going to be finding a lot of old material or old rocks from the early on in the Earth's existence. Uh, we also find um, very few craters on the Earth. And I mean impact craters or volcanic craters. Uh, they're all, they're pretty few, few and far between. Uh, there's an image of the meteor crater right over here on the left hand side that is actually located up here in northern Arizona over at Winslow as well. And uh, that is the um, sorry, <laughs> uh, that is the most well preserved impact crater on the planet that we can find here. And this gives us a very good knowledge about some of these layers of the Earth's surface, right? Because we have this big hole in the ground that was created by the impact of a very large uh, meteor, right? And uh, then over here on the right-hand side, we have a volcanic crater that's Crater Lake, and it has been filled in with water. The majority, the vast majority of the craters that we find on Earth, especially impact craters, are filled with, they can be filled with water or they might be filled in with sediment or other things as well. And so we can't study some of the older rocks at the bottom of those craters. Likewise, they can be eroded away to basically nothingness. And so they're very difficult to find and hard to study because of this. Um, on the other hand, right, we have the moon, which is, you know, just a few thousand miles away from us. I think it's about 250,000 miles away, right? On the moon, we have thousands of impact craters, but we don't see any of these geologic processes like you would see with the Earth. So the moon is completely lacking in atmosphere and in liquid on the surface. And there, and there are moonquakes and there are long since extinct volcanoes, but we don't have any active volcanoes. So the moon's surface isn't changing very rapidly anymore. There isn't anything carrying sediment away somewhere else and uh, filling in these craters or tearing them down. So these craters are basically gonna be there forever, right? Uh, that means that we can learn a lot just about the Earth, or we can learn a lot about the moon specifically, and by
by dating these craters and learning about what's inside them. And uh, so just to kind of jump into a different subject really briefly, uh, we can talk about how uh, planets are formed, right? So just from ob observing other solar systems, we can observe protoplanetary disks that we have out here, like this little image over here on the right hand side. Uh, we can learn about how solar systems are formed. So uh, it's largely believed that our solar system formed from a cloud of gas called a nebula. And uh, the sun formed first, it took most of that gas and dust and it became part of the sun. But then a debris disk formed around that as it started to spin. And that debris disk is what would eventually form into our planets and asteroids and comets that we have here in the solar system today. And uh, the gas and ice giants, those ones formed more quickly, they formed first. That's why Jupiter is the biggest. And then the smaller terrestrial planets, they took a little bit longer to form, but they, they formed slowly over time uh, through the process of accretion. And accretion is when you have one tiny little space rock and it's floating out there in space and it crashes into another space rock and they basically, they stick together and they keep finding more and more space rocks to run into until eventually you have a planetary body that has enough mass that things are just going to naturally want to fall towards it, right? So we have these uh, bodies of basically molten rock at this point. It's going to become very hot and you're going to have lots of volcanoes on the surface, a lot of liquid molten rock just sitting there on the surface. And then this is going to be a basically a protoplanet, which is what we kind of can see a concept of here on the left hand side as an idea of a planet accreting into a new one. So when the uh, Earth formed, right, it slowly started to cool down. And even today, the Earth is still going through this cooling process. We know that it has a very hot interior. It has a hot molten core. Right? And it will continue to cool down over time. And the moon is much less smaller than the Earth. So it took less time to much less smaller. It is much smaller than the Earth. So it took less time to cool down. So we don't find a lot of these volcanic processes like you would find on the Earth. Uh, so here we have a picture of the full moon. This is, you know, we've all seen the moon. It doesn't change, right? The moon's tidally locked with the Earth. So we always see the same face all the time. And there are certain features that we should probably talk about here. So we have these dark, these dark areas right here. And then we have these light areas around here, right? I'm really hoping that everybody's actually seeing my cursor and it's not just me. <laughs> but uh, these dark areas, those are called maria. Maria is the Latin word for seas or ocean, right? And then uh, incidentally, the Lighter areas, those are typically called the highlands, but uh, they have also been called the like terrain, like land, because a long time ago, oh, thank you, a long time ago, people used to think that the moon had actual oceans on it, and that's what they were seeing there. Uh, so we can tell just from this one picture on the right hand side here, this is a look up close of Mare Crisium, it's one of the lunar Maria, and you can tell immediately the texture of a mare, a mare is definitely smoother than the area of the land surrounding it. You can see in the outer, that I can't see because I have something in the way. <laughs> you can see the outer rim of it. There's a lot of craters. We have mountains out here. And then of course we have this wide, flat area with very few craters in between, right? So this tells us that th these Maria, they are much younger than the highlands on the moon. 
these are most likely basins that have been filled in with lava flows. And so my, most likely what happened when the moon was first forming early on, as it cooled down, these were the last parts of the moon to actually cool down. They were these molten lava lakes on the surface. And so that means these craters on this mare is, are gonna be much younger than probably a lot of the craters on the surrounding area, right? So we can learn a lot about the moon by collecting different rocks from different parts of the moon, right? Uh, so that's kind of one of the things that happened when the astronauts went to the moon way back in the 1960s and 70s. So we had uh, six missions of manned missions to the moon. Uh, I can, I, I've been told to point out Mare Crisium on the larger photo and, you know, I don't actually know which one it is, but I think it's this one right here. If I'm wrong, then someone point it out to me, okay? <laughs> but yeah. All right, so uh, there were six manned missions to the moon. And you can see here where all the different landing sites were. And five of the six of them landed in Amari. And that's because, as we've already seen, they are much flatter to land on and definitely much easier. But I mean, if you're going to land on something, I'd rather land on like a flat area than like on the top of a mountain, right? Except for uh, Apollo 16 was the only one that landed in the highlands. And so when we collected rock samples, I believe we collected something like 800 pounds of rocks from the moon and brought them back to Earth. When we collected these rock samples, we're going to have probably a very um, specific type of rock that we're going to be finding with these. Uh, and then uh, in Apollo 16, when they brought those rocks back, they're going to find that's going to be different than the rest of them. And uh, as it turns out, the Apollo missions brought back mostly basalt rock. And that's what it turns out that the Mare are made out of. They're going to be made out of basalt rock. That's a type of rock that you can find around volcanoes, right? It's basically spread out everywhere here um, in Flagstaff. So uh, for the most part, uh, that's what the Mare are made out of and the area in the highlands. Those are going to be more um, like feldspar type rocks. They're, they're, they're significantly lighter in color and they're going to be a little bit more uh, silicon rich. So we have two uh, types of rocks that we have on these images right here. And one of these was brought back by Apollo 15. It's this olivine basalt rock right here. Uh, so this rock was one of the ones that was collected by the astronauts and brought back. And then on the right hand side, we have a lunar meteorite. So as it turns out, we can find meteorites here on Earth that have come from the moon. And the way this would happen is if there's a large impact on the moon, sometimes that debris gets shot out of the moon's orbit and will sometimes find its way to Earth or even other planets. So we can sometimes find lunar meteorites. We can study these and these are very helpful because these aren't going to be from very specific areas like the Apollo landings they're going to be from all over the moon. Some of these meteorites have been found to have come from the far side of the moon even. So this gives us a more random sample of lunar rocks. And I kind of find it kind of fascinating that we're able to tell that these came from the moon at all. And what we have learned from both of these samples of rocks that we have, these lunar meteorites and these rocks that were brought back by the astronauts is that the composition of the moon is very similar, even close to being identical to the composition of the crust on the Earth. And uh, what that tells us is it tells us a little bit about how the moon might have formed. There's a lot of hypotheses on how, this moon, how the moon has formed. Some people 
have argued that it was a body that was captured by the Earth. But the leading hypothesis right now would be the one that tells us that perhaps the moon was formed from a large impact when the Earth was very young. So this is supposed to be a moving GIF, but it is not, it was working earlier, but it's not working now. So uh, that's a bummer. Uh, but uh, anyway, it's hypothesized that there was a large Mars-sized planetary body and early on when the Earth was still young and molten, it crashed into the Earth and both of these planets were essentially obliterated. And what you would be seeing in this GIF as this happened is they kind of make a great big mess of debris out in space and eventually that would reaccrete back into the Earth. There would be a debris disk that forms around the Earth and that would eventually form into the moon. And that's why the Earth and the moon are going to be made out of largely the same type of stuff or that's what we would find. So uh, this, this is what we have learned from studying lunar meteorites and some of the moon rocks that were brought back by the Apollo missions. Uh, moving on, we can learn a little bit about uh, a little a little bit about what happened shortly after the formation of the Earth and Moon by studying the Moon's craters. So we got a nice picture of the far side of the Moon here on the left-hand side, <clears throat> and on the right-hand side, we got a couple famous craters. We have Tycho Crater right down here and Copernicus right up here at the top, right there. We have found craters have been dated from ages all the way from 4.2, 4.5 billion years ago to even maybe 100 million years ago. So, as, so they do vary in age, and that's because, you know, there's still a lot of debris out there in space that hasn't collided with anything yet. And uh, uh, Tycho is one of the youngest craters that we have on the moon. Tycho is about 100 million years old or so. So that's, that's very young for a crater, right? You can see that it happened after a, a lot of stuff because it's got these ejecta blankets, these rays that are coming out from it that are covering up stuff around it, right? Uh, but the majority of these craters that have been dated on the moon have been dated about 3.9 billion years ago. So there's this big cluster of craters that all date to the same age. And so this brings us to um, the theory of the late heavy bombardment that happened uh, in the Earth's early, Earth and Moon's early life. And so uh, this was a period when basically the Earth and the Moon were being pummeled by tons of space debris, asteroids and comets that were just crashing into them constantly. And we don't see any evidence of this late heavy bombardment on the Earth because most of our rocks on Earth are gonna be younger than 3.9 billion years ago. I believe that most of the, the oldest rocks that have been dated on Earth are about 4.6 billion years old, except uh, a lot of those are actually meteorites. And there are very few rocks that date this old on Earth. So we have very little evidence here on Earth that point to anything that happened before, before this time period. Because the Earth, again, was still very young and it's still undergoing a lot of processes. Uh, so this late heavy bombardment is very interesting. Uh, because we're, it tells us a little bit more about the solar system itself, not just the Earth. This supports, or one thing that um, could have caused the late heavy bombardment is what we call the Nice model. Uh, that is spelled correctly. It is spelled like that. So the Nice model was proposed back in, uh, it's, it's from Nice, France. It was proposed back in 2005, and it's strongly supported by other astronomers. And what it tells us is early on in the solar system, at when it was basically very first formed 
all of the planets were much closer to the sun than they are today. Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, they were a lot closer. Uh, but Saturn and Jupiter, they entered a two to one residence. Resonance. So for every two orbits that Jupiter made around the sun, Saturn made one orbit. And after Jupiter's second orbit, Saturn and Jupiter would be at their closest distance to each other. They interacted gravitationally. It kind of messed up their orbits. They got flung in kind of a uh, elliptical orbit as opposed to a circular one that they were in before. And this sent them farther out in, from the sun in the solar system. And of course, this kind of sent Uranus and Neptune farther out as well. And so Neptune started messing with a lot of the debris that was in the outer solar system and stuff that was previously in a stable orbit was now getting flung out in all different directions. So a lot of that got sent towards the inner, inner solar system, which could be a cause of the late heavy bombardment. So those are a few things that we can learn about the Earth just from studying the moon. Now the Nice model was uh, it's a little bit more involved than just studying the moon, obviously, but uh, there's a few things that we can learn and that we want to learn uh, from studying uh, Earth meteorites found on the moon. Now we have not found any Earth meteorites on the moon yet. We haven't had enough missions to the surface and been able to find them. They're probably, just like moon meteorites, are still few and far between. Uh, but if we can find Earth meteorites in the future, in future missions, we can study those and we can learn a lot about the uh, chemical composition of the Earth as it was four and a half billion years ago when it first formed. And this could tell us about the Earth's, uh, the crust, <clears throat> excuse me, the crust and the mantle. It could tell us about the conditions under which life was beginning to form. And it could teach us a lot about how life formed, which is something that is very interesting and still constantly being studied. And then uh, one more thing that we can, that we would like to study more uh, upon visiting the moon next is we could maybe learn about Earth's early atmosphere. So again, uh, if we were able to collect some more lunar samples, we might be able to find some of Earth's atmosphere trapped in these samples. And that's because uh, the moon itself is pulling away from the Earth, maybe about one and a half inches per year. So it is getting farther away from us, which means that maybe 3.9 billion years ago, the Earth and the moon were a lot closer together. And the moon could have been interacting with Earth's atmosphere a little bit. And so we might be able to find some of these early Earth atmosphere gases trapped inside of some of these rocks. And again, it can tell us about the conditions that were happening on Earth at that time. They can tell us about how, give us a little more information about how life might have formed in the early, early ages of the Earth. Uh, so that does conclude my little presentation. I know we have a lot of questions that have come in, so I can take some time to answer some of those before we move on to Resi talking about, um, about the uh, of Artemis missions. And let me just, I have to find them. I did see someone had asked about how far away the moon is, and I, of course, am drawing a blank now that everybody's watching me, and I want to say it's about 250,000 miles away or maybe it was 250,000 kilometers, but somewhere about around that distance. So it's a really, it's a really far distance. It doesn't seem like it. Uh, it took the Apollo astronauts about three days to get to the moon. Um, we'd probably, in modern technology, might even be able to get there a little bit faster in modern rockets. Of course, it would take several months if you were to drive there at like highway speeds. The moon is about one and a half light seconds away from the Earth or so. So we're not looking at the moon too far in the past, right? And then uh, 
Someone was asking if I think it's possible to have a base on the moon before sending astronauts to Mars. And I think that's what the Artemis, the Artemis talk is going to be about. Uh, so I'm going to let Resi answer that when she starts her talk. She's going to know a lot more about that than myself, but um, I'm going to give a wild guess and say yes. <laughs> and then Resi will give you a better answer for that. And then, uh, so why does the moon have less gravity? And that is actually, that's a very interesting question. And the thing is, is anything that has mass has gravity. I have gravity. I don't have very much mass, so you're not going to feel how much gravity I have. So the moon has about one-sixth of the mass of the Earth, which means that the moon's going to have one-sixth of the gravitational force as well, because it's so much smaller than the Earth. And it's actually a little bit less dense, as it turns out, because its core isn't as big as the Earth's. Uh, so that means that Jupiter being a thousand times more massive than the Earth is going to have a thousand times more gravitational force. So uh, gravity, um, when we're talking about Newton's laws anyway, gravity is uh, associated uh, very closely with how much mass an object has. Uh, so yeah, so someone did ask about the Mare Crisium. I think I answered, I did my best to answer that. <laughs> I can go back to that picture and point out the Mare Crisium again, just for the heck of it. And I do believe it's this one, but I'm not uh, quite familiar with the names of all of the uh, lunar Maria. I picked this picture, to be honest, because it was really pretty. <laughs> so I know that uh, this one's the Sea of Tranquility. This is where the Apollo 11 astronauts landed. Oops, this one's the Sea of Tranquility because that's where the Apollo astronauts landed. And that one is usually the one that I just remember. And then, uh, and then someone asked how the moon stays in orbit. And that is, that also has to do with gravity. So it's basically because of the momentum of the system and the gravitational force of the earth. The moon is going incredibly fast. I mean, it doesn't seem like it, right? It looks like it's staying still in the sky, but it is moving incredibly fast as it orbits the earth. And the earth is tugging on the moon and the moon is tugging on the earth. Likewise, there's a mutual gravitational force between them. And that's what's keeping the moon from flying off into the solar system somewhere. Because if we did suddenly turn off earth's gravity, that's what the moon would do is it would just fly off somewhere. Fortunately, that's not something that can just happen. And of course, the thing that's preventing the moon from falling into the earth, God forbid, is it's speed as it is orbiting the earth. So uh, this is because of a centripetal force. And uh, <clears throat> looking for some more questions. Uh, all right, so uh, it looks like I have no more questions uh, coming from any of the comments. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm, I'm gonna wrap this up and I'm going to send this over to uh, Kevin Schindler, uh, my cousin, quote unquote, right? And we're gonna let him do a little bit of talking. There he is. You're on mute, bud. There we go. <laughs> so I'm got, I just want to tie this up. You know, Lowell Observatory, it's really interesting when we talk about what we do here because it's really this combination of, of uh, tying the past and the present. Um, we've had moon mapping that was done here back in the 60s. Um, astronauts came here to study the moon. And tonight we're looking at the same thing that they saw um, and here's our live view of the moon. Um, and Josie, what you were saying, the Sea of Crises, um, that is, or Mari Crisium, Sea of Crises, that's that solitary um, area right at the bottom. And the apparent um, movement there is not because there are clouds moving on the moon. <laughs> that's because of our atmosphere, the Earth's atmosphere. Um, but this is really a pretty great shot because 
um, the way we're seeing, and then we have the sea of uh, crises. Right above that, the big circular area in the middle, as Josie said, is the sea of tranquility. And right over around here is where Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin became the first humans to step on another world um, back in 1969. Um, so we'd really like to thank everybody for joining us tonight. Um, it's been a pleasure to bring the International Observe the Moon Night the National Astronomy Day sponsored by Finley Toyota. And I think we're gonna end with this lovely shot showing the moon with some cloud cover coming over. That's what's great about the moon. Even with some clouds, we can still make out a lot of detail. And I guess that's probably what makes it kind of eerie and spectacular to see also. So with that, I, I believe we're ending our coverage. Um, we'd like to thank everybody for joining us tonight. And um, if you want to join us for some of these special VIP viewing sessions at, at uh, the Giovanni Open Deck Observatory, the Clark Telescope, and the Dyer Telescope, um, you can check our website for more information. So thanks so much, everybody, for, for joining us, and we hope to see you soon. <laughs>